Now let's look at the let's look at the slightly advanced topics for the executor service. So in the previous videos, we looked at how to create a new fixed thread pool and the other types of pool. And the method we called for that was very straightforward. So what we use is a static method called executors dot new fixed thread pool or executors dot new cached thread pool, and that creates the thread pool for us. Internally, if you look at the source code, all it does is it just calls a constructor for the thread pool executor. This constructor, of course, accepts this list of parameters. For every different type of thread pool, the num the actual arguments which are passed are slightly different. So let's look at the list of these parameters. The first and the second is the core pool size, max pool size, and related to that is the keeper life timeout. We'll look at how it affects the core and max pool size in a bit. The next bit is about the work queue. This is the blocking queue in which all the tasks are stored. Then there is a thread factory, which is the factory used to create new threads in case the pool needs new threads. And the last but not least is the rejected execution handler. This is the callback or an handler method which is used to handle the rejections when you submit the tasks to the queue and the thread pool is unable to accept those tasks. Okay. So going back to the first two parameters, which was the core pool size and the max pool size. The core pool size is the initial size or the base size for a thread pool. And based on the type of pool, if the thread pool needs to add more threads, it will add so and increase the value of the pool size. In that case, the current pool size will be slightly different from the core pool size. The max pool size determines how the upper threshold, the max pool size determines the upper threshold for a pool size to be. And the keep alive time is the time for which if a thread remains idle and if there are no other tasks, then the thread pool can kill the threads. So in that case, instead of expanding, the thread pool can contract or it can shrink. So number of threads can slowly be deleted and removed from the thread pool. So in that case, the pool size will slowly sh shrink down to core pool size and it will never go below the core pool size, right? So let's look at what the values are for four types of thread pool, which we saw in the earlier videos. So for the fixed thread pool, the core pool size and the max pool size are the same which is the constructor argument passed and the keeper lifetime is zero. Zero is slightly misleading. Uh, zero is supposed to be read as not applicable. Okay, so the keeper lifetime for the fixed thread pool is not applicable because there is no killing of threads or adding of new threads uh, apart from maintaining the core pool size. Uh, the next bit is the cache thread pool. So initially it starts with zero threads and it can go on to the maximum number of threads allowable. So since the thread count is always an integer, so the maximum number of threads you can have is integer dot max value. And of course, you do not want to keep growing your pool size because all the threads will consume a lot of memory. You will have a keeper lifetime. So the keeper lifetime in this case is 60 seconds. So if a thread is idle for 60 seconds and there is no task assigned to it, then the thread pool will kill that particular thread. In scheduled thread pool, we have the base core pool size as whatever is passed in the constructor argument and the max pool size is the maximum of the integer value. And here, similarly, we have a keep a lifetime of 60 seconds. The last one is a single threaded executor, which as the name suggests, will have a size of only one. So that is why the core pool size and the max pool size, both of them are one. And of course, since there is a no except expansion or shrinking of the core pool size, we do not have a keep a lifetime. So in this case, it is the default, which is zero seconds. There is a sp special method on the thread pool or the executor service, which is allow core thread timeout, which is mentioned here at the bottom. This method indicates whether the core pool size itself can be reduced or expanded. Okay, and the default value is false, but you can set it to true. Now let's move on to the next part, which is the types of queues. So before we go into the type of queues, let's just summarize what we learned earlier, which was whenever a new task is submitted to the thread pool, 
it is saved in a queue which is of type blocking queue and then all the tasks go to this queue fetch the task and execute it now this queue can be of different types based on the type of executors so in case of fixed thread pool we have a linked blocking queue and it's the same for the single threaded executor the reason why it's a linked blocking queue and not an array blocking queue is because array blocking queue is limited in size while the linked blocking queue can keep on increasing its size since the thread pool itself is of a limited size that means the number of threads are limited we cannot have the number of tasks to be limited so number of tasks can keep on increasing and you need a storage area to keep storing all the tasks while the threads are executing and then they can fetch the tasks from that storage area and that is why that storage area needs to be an unbounded or a very large storage area and that is the reason it is a linked blocking queue for a cached thread pool there is no queue as such there is this data structure called synchronous queue since the number of threads are unbounded so you can have virtually unlimited number of threads so you do not need a storage area to store all the tasks so what you have is synchronous queue which is sort of a queue with only a single storage area so anytime a task is submitted there is only a single slot and the thread pool will immediately empty that slot and create a new thread for the next type which is the scheduled thread pool we have a special kind of queue which is called a delayed work queue and we need this type of queue because scheduled thread pool deals with schedules or time based execution of tasks so the delayed work queue is the type of queue which will return the tasks based on whether their scheduled time has passed or not and you can also have a custom type of thread pool where instead of a linked blocking queue which is sort of an unbounded queue you can have a bounded queue to store the tasks so let's look at the last part which is the rejection handler so let's say we have a thread pool where all the 10 threads are already busy with 10 tasks and we have a blocking queue of type say array blocking queue array blocking queue is a bounded queue and let's say the queue is already full so let's say the queue is of size 100 and there are 100 tasks already in the queue and there are 10 threads which are already executing 10 other tasks so total number of tasks within the thread pool is 110 when the next bit of task is submitted the thread pool has no area to store it and there is no num no new threads to be created and run since all are busy so what the thread pool will do is it has to reject the task and we can tell the thread pool during its creation that if you reject the task i want you to reject it in a certain way and that is based on the policy that you decide on when you're creating the thread pool so there are four kinds of policies one is called the abort policy so whenever you submit a new task which the thread pool cannot execute it will just throw an runtime exception and that exception is of type rejected execution exception the second kind is of discard policy so if the thread pool is not able to take the task it will silently discard it there will be no notification to the caller that the new task is not being handled the third one is discard oldest where it takes a new task but the oldest task it has in the queue it will delete that task and the last one which is the caller runs policy will take that task and ask the caller itself to execute that task so let's say the main thread is submitting the task number 111 and during the rejection the thread pool will ask the main thread itself to run that 111th task so the main thread will run the 111th task and that is how there is a feedback loop wherein the main thread has no other option but to run it and it cannot submit the 112th task so it is sort of a feedback mechanism to slow down the main thread to slow down the number of pushes or the number of new tasks that are submitted to the thread pool so let's look at the rejected exception in terms of the code so let's say we have a custom thread pool which we create directly using the constructor we have a core pool size of 10 a max pool size of 100 a keep alive time of 120 seconds and we have a bounded queue which is the array blocking queue of maximum capacity 300 so whenever if you submit the 301st task or let's say 400 task and the and the threads are already busy 
in that case the thread pool will throw a rejected execution exception you can also pass a custom rejection handler which is kind of a callback handler wherein if a task is rejected then the rejected execution method of that particular handler will be called and then you can perform any logging or other operations with that runnable after that let's look at the lifecycle methods of a thread pool so until now we only spoke about how to start a thread pool and uh, how to run methods on it but we haven't seen how to shut down a thread pool so to shut down the thread pool we have this straightforward method called service dot shutdown but note that this will just initiate the shutdown it will not immediately shut the whole executor down and the reason is there can be a lot of tasks which are already submitted to the executor service so there is a blocking queue and it has say three or four tasks and the thread are also running a few tasks so it cannot immediately shut down everything it will say okay i have initiated it and any new tasks that you submit to me after this i'll not accept it but i'll complete whatever tasks that you have already given to me and that is why if you see the next part of code if you try to submit a task after the shutdown it will throw a rejection execution exception because you already told it to shut it down and you are submitting it to new task you can also call service dot is shutdown to check if you have initiated the shutdown okay this does not mean that the shutdown is completed it just says if the shutdown is initiated or it has begun so if you want to see if the shutdown is completed then the method for that is is terminated and this will return true if all the tasks are completed including the ones which were queued in that blocking queue sometimes you do not want to wait for long for all the tasks to be submitted so in that case you can call await termination await termination is a method where you can say block until all these tasks are completed which have already been submitted or block only until this particular timeout which i am giving it to you after that you just continue with the operation and the final method is service dot shutdown now service dot shutdown now will return all the tasks that were queued but the execution was not initiated so that is different from service dot shutdown which will initiate the shutdown but it will complete all the tasks that the thread are currently running and it will also complete all the tasks that are currently in the blocking queue and in shutdown now it will complete all the tasks that thread are running but it will not initiate or execute any of the tasks that are that are queued it will immediately return all those tasks in the form of list of runnables so in this case you can loop through all the runnables which are not yet initiated and you can log them or do your own operation that's it for this video thanks a lot for listening in the next video we'll look at the callables and the futures in executor service